Hello, welcome to People's Church at Home service. My name is Shaka. If you're joining us for the first time, it's so great to have you with us. You could not have chosen a better Sunday to join us than this particular day. It is the first Sunday of the month, and therefore, we will partake in communion together. We will also receive a blessed message from Pastor Mondley just later on. In the meantime, let's get to our feet as we get ready to praise and worship together. Let us sing. Do ya? 
Hello everyone, we are glad that once again you can join us for our Sunday service. We trust that you're well. My job is to bring you an encouragement from the Word of God with regards to giving. Now as I was thinking of giving, I thought, what could I share with people after seven months of lockdown? After seven months of perhaps losing a job? After seven months of struggling to know where your next meal is coming from and the Lord led me to the book of Nehemiah I'd like to encourage you to take some time and read the whole book because we'll not have enough time to go into the verses that I think will encourage you today firstly I'd like to start from chapter 1 in the book of Nehemiah and from verse 1 to 4 I'm not going to read the verses because like I said, it's going to take some time. But the story or the context in this story is that Nehemiah received news from home. He received news that the Jews had returned home and he received news that the walls had fallen and there was a very bad situation at home. And this broke Nehemiah's heart. And the Bible says that Nehemiah fasted and he prayed and he mourned because of what he had heard that was going on at home. And you're thinking today, okay, how does this affect us? What does this mean? And I would like to draw attention to Nehemiah's response. Now, although Nehemiah was not directly affected by the situation in Jerusalem, Nehemiah was connected to the hearts of the people. And this grieved Nehemiah's heart. And he was concerned about their suffering and this meant that he was suffering with them. Nehemiah could feel their shame, their disgrace, their fear and their trouble that the children of Israel were feeling at that time. And this caused Nehemiah to cry out. He mourned, he fasted and he prayed. You don't mourn and you don't fast for something that you don't hold dear to you. So this shows that Nehemiah was deeply affected and moved by what was happening to the people around him. And he started praying. He prayed for wisdom and he prayed for favor. And he prayed for a solution. And in chapter 2, we find that Nehemiah moves from praying to acting. And this action could have cost him his own comfort, his own job, because he would have to approach his king and say, there is something at home that I need to attend to and leave his job, his duty post, because of something that was affecting other people. This got me thinking that sometimes we spend a lot of time praying and we forget that we indeed need to act. In chapter three, we see that everyone puts their hands to work. There are a lot of names that are listed in chapter 3. People and their children, high priests, neighboring towns. You know, there was something to be done in everyone chose to get involved. There were people, I mean professional people. We hear of blacksmiths that were mentioned there. And in our day and age, maybe you don't know what a blacksmith is. But we're talking about people who had their own professional jobs. You know, we hear of merchants, which in our days would mean business people. They got involved. Community leaders got involved. Everyone knew that there was something to do, and they got involved. In chapter 4, they faced opposition. Serious opposition. It was so bad that the Bible records in verse 17 that the builders would build with one hand, and they would hold a weapon with the other hand. They all built with a sword in their belts because they knew that at any moment they could be attacked and they would rather die than stop building and this for me started to challenge my thinking in chapter 6 it speaks about how the building took as long as 52 days before it was completed and for me I thought when they started they probably did not realize that it would take that long some probably thought ah, maybe a week some thought 
a month, you know, just like when the COVID uh, pandemic hit our, hit our borders, I don't think anybody anticipated that it would be October and there will still be in lockdown. But it is what it is right now. So as I pondered on the whole story, I thought I'd highlight a few points that would encourage you this morning or today, depending on what time you're watching this. You know, um, this past week, on the news headlines, it said that 2.2 million people had lost their jobs. And I thought, wow, you know, for these people, these are broken walls. These are fallen walls because they are vulnerable. They are in need. They've lost their sense of protection. They've lost their sense of provision. They are feeling exposed. And I thought, how do we respond to that? If you're sitting today and you still have your job, did that news affect you in any way? Did you think, well, tough, I'm still okay? Or did you start thinking of mourning and fasting and praying to God? That is the first point. The second point is we need to pray. We need to pray for God's people. We need to pray for restoration. We need to pray for rebuilt walls. We need to pray for jobs and pray for families because that is our first line of giving. The best thing and the first thing you can give anybody in any situation is to actually pray for them. Then we don't stop when we pray. We don't stop after praying. We need to ask God, God, how can I get involved? What can I do? You know, you hear that your neighbor has lost his job or her job. What can I do, God? How can I help in this situation should be our response. You hear that a church member you know, is, is without school fees for their child and children have to return to school. You ask yourself, what can I do and how can I get involved? And the, second, the third thing is do whatever you can. Do whatever you can. In chapter 3 of Nehemiah, people were just doing things. Some people held the window. Some people held the door. You know, sometimes you may just think that carrying a brick is something small, but you need to hold the brick for, for the next person to get it. You know, sometimes you feel that, okay, all I need to do is to hold the nails, but that job is very important in the bigger picture. So no matter what your contribution is, it's never too little or insignificant. And then the next thing is, giving is not always going to be convenient. It is a sacrifice. You may have to go without yourself. You know, giving exposes you to the possibility of also experiencing lack. Nehemiah could have decided to go and build a city and then lose his job permanently, you know, because he now is choosing to help people. And we're not saying make careless decisions. We're saying open your heart to the response to the possibility or not the possibility, the reality that giving is not always going to be comfortable. Giving is not a once-off thing. It took 52 days, 52 days of showing up, 52 days of passing that screw, that nail, that timber, that brick. 52 days. Sometimes we get tired of giving, but we should not. We need to give and give and give some more until the wall is built. And the last point is as long as you trust God and remain in obedience, God will always come through for us. So this morning, I want to encourage you, family. People among us have lost their jobs. People among us have lost family members in this season. People among us are going without. People among us do not know how they're going to pay their rent at the end of the month. But then where do we need to come in? We need to stop looking over our balconies. We need to stop thinking we are safe. We need to get on the ground. We need to walk out of our high gates and start building our neighbor's walls. God bless you as you give. The giving the bank details will show on the screen. And we trust that God will continue to take care of you. And as we build together, may God continue to strengthen us and give us courage not to give up. God bless you. Amen. Good morning, church. Today is the first Sunday of the month. 
which means it's communion Sunday. And I do hope that everyone is ready with their emblems to partake in Holy Communion this morning. You know, communion should be something that is special to every Christian. We shouldn't view this as something that we do just once a month or a tradition that is meaningless. This is more than just bread and juice. It's a special time where one, we get to remember what Christ did for us. And secondly, we do this in obedience as Jesus has commanded us to do. So now we're going to read from 1 Corinthians 11 verse 24 to 26. And this is how it reads. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We observe two things that Jesus said from the scripture. Firstly, he broke it and said, This is my blood. The bread represents Christ's body. It represents his broken body which hung on the cross for you and I. It represents the gruesome death that Jesus had to go through simply because he loves us. And when we partake in communion, we remember how lost we were. We remember how blind we were. We remember how messed up we were. And that it's through Christ's broken body at the cross that we were found. That we can now see that the addictions and the bondages and the shame that used to hold us down is now broken. And secondly, he says that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So the juice represents Christ's body. Christ's blood, sorry. As we drink the juice, we remember the new covenant that is found in Christ's blood. That we don't need the blood of bulls or the blood of goats anymore. His blood was shed for all of us on the cross and it is sufficient. So as we partake of Holy Communion this morning, let us remember what Christ did for us and celebrate what we received as a result of his sacrifice. There is a reason why Jesus kept on saying, do this in remembrance of me. And it's so that we never forget the greatest form of love that we see on the cross.
Today I'm going to talk briefly about one of the most important spiritual disciplines that we need to put into place in our lives as believers. In fact, the title of my message today is The Lost Spiritual Discipline. And before I get into it, someone might be wondering, well, what is a spiritual discipline? Um, Dr. Don Whitney defines spiritual disciplines as those practices found in Scripture that promote spiritual growth among believers in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in essence, they are the things that believers do in order to grow in character and in how they live to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now, let us turn our Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 8. And this is where Paul writes, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And at first glance, I must admit that this looks like rather a strange command from Paul. And in fact, it looks like Paul is just throwing in random things for the believers to think about. But let me remind us that the book of Philippians is also known as Paul's joy letter. The concept of joy or being joyful or rejoicing appears 16 times in just the four chapters of this book. This is a very short letter indeed, but it is saturated with teachings about rejoicing and living a joyous life. In fact, even as Pastor Kulu reminded us last week, that Paul's mood in this letter is joyous. And in fact, he's inviting his readers to also join in him in this lifestyle of living a life that is full of joy. And there's a couple of lessons that we can learn from this letter. The first one is that joy is not dependent on your circumstances, or is also not dependent upon my circumstances. Because if it were, then Paul would have been the last person on the whole planet to be joyful. And yet, at the same time, Paul was in one of the worst conditions and situations one could find themselves in, and yet he was still full of joy. Joy, then, is the quiet, confident assurance of God's love and work in one's life. It comes from the knowledge that regardless of what happens in your life and in my life, that God still loves us, that we are still the children of God 
if we are believers. And this is the knowledge that even though I may go through difficult and even painful situations and circumstances in my life, that doesn't change the fact that I am still the loved and the child of God. So joy comes from the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for us as believers. Joy does not depend upon the circumstances in and around us in, in the time that we find ourselves in. And Paul takes this moment to give uh, the, the believers in Philippi one of his last teachings on joy. And he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I am sure that this makes up a huge amount of things for believers to think about. And this, for me, seems to be the, ma the main point of Paul's teaching in this verse, because I'm, I'm, I was wondering, why is Paul saying this to, to the believers in Philippi? Why is he saying this specifically to them? Why this command? Why this teaching? And for me, this seems as if uh, this is the main point. And the main point is this, that the amount of joy that you and I will experience in our lives is dependent on what we focus our minds on. As believers, think about it, the amount of joy that we will ever experience in our lives is dependent upon what we focus on in our minds. And this is why Paul is encouraging them and reminding them to focus on these things. And, and you know that there are thoughts and meditations that steal our joy from our lives. And there are those thoughts, there are those uh, moments and ideas that we think about that increase the amount of joy in our lives. And Paul wants the believers in Philippi to focus on those things that sustain and enhance their joy. Isn't it interesting that you can do something and receive 99 positive feedback and only one negative feedback, and you go home, you lose sleep, you toss and turn on your bed at night over the one negative feedback instead of focusing on the 99 positive feedback. It is so easy for us to focus on things that are negative, to focus on lies, to focus you know, on things that are not good. That is why Paul is giving Philippians the secret to long-lasting joy as a Christian in your life. Focus on the things that are positive. Stop focusing on the negative things. Focus on the things that are true. Stop focusing on lies and things that are dishonorable. If you go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, I believe this verse gives us the importance of what Paul is talking about. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, above everything that I've already uh, told you, above all the other teachings that I've given you, guard your heart. Everything you do, comes from it. I like this. Above everything else, you know, all of those other things are important, but above everything else, guard your heart because everything you do in life flows from your heart. And it, it's interesting to note that the word that is translated heart in this verse can also be translated inner man, mind, will, or heart. And so the writer of Proverbs is not just talking about the physical organ that pumps blood into the rest of your body. He is talking about the core of your being. He's talking about the real you on the inside. And he says, guard that person, guard that part of your life, because everything that you do, in fact, the, another translation says, says um, all the issues of life spring from it. So guard your heart. This is why Paul gives uh, the Philippians this very important command and teaching to focus on positive things, to focus on things that are good. And Paul gives them and us a framework for them to be able to filter their every thought. I believe this is what this is. It is a framework that we need to filter each and every thought that passes through our minds. And we need to ask ourselves, we need to literally catch, you know, not literally, we need to uh, figuratively catch, you know, every thought and look at it and ask ourselves a couple of questions about that thought. As it crosses uh, through our minds, we need to catch it and ask ourselves, is this thought true? Is this thought 
honorable? Is this thought just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it commendable? Is there anything excellent in it? Is there anything about it that is worthy of praise? And if it passes that test, if it passes that framework test of each and every one of our thoughts, then we need to, we can allow it, you know, to remain in our minds. We can continue and we must continue to think about it. But if it fails that thought, then you and I need to take it captive or, or you know, or arrest that thought because those are the thoughts that still join from our lives instead of enhancing and sustaining the joy in our lives. And I'd like to ask you, what about you, you know, in your life, in your thought life? Do you have a problem with bad or negative thoughts that always leave you miserable, you know, that always suck joy and life out of your life? The good news is that you can take control of your thought life. You can train your mind by applying Paul's thought framework into each and every one of your thoughts. And it's true, I admit, that in the beginning, it will be a little bit mechanical. You know, it won't be as natural. But as you continue to train your mind, as you make it into a habit, that is the more natural that it will become in your life. And I would encourage you to put it into practice in your life this week. You know, uh, catch thoughts as they are crossing through your mind and run them through this framework uh, that Paul gives us. Ask questions about it and allow it to continue if it passes or arrest it if it does not pass this framework test. And remember, this is the important part. This is the important point that I believe Paul is driving across to the Philippians. He's saying the amount of joy that you and I will experience as Christians in our lives is dependent on what we focus on in our minds, on what we focus our minds on. That will determine the amount of joy that we will experience in our lives. And at this point, you may be asking yourself, this is all well and good. You know, this is all nice. But what is this lost spiritual discipline? I haven't heard you talk about it. And I would like to say to you, that's a great question. And that's what I'm going to focus on right now. In fact, if you read the very same verse in the New King James Version, this is what it says. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And we need to understand that as believers, the chief objective for reading the Bible or, or studying the Bible for us is not to accumulate more knowledge, but it is for what we read to change us. It's for what we read to, to transform our lives. It is for us to live changed lives. It is not just simply a, a checkbox ticking exercise. It is not for us to know more scripture than the next person, but we want to live changed lives. And we don't engage with the Bible or the scriptures in order to critique the Bible, but it is rather to allow the Bible to critique our lives. That is the main purpose. That is the reason that we engage with the scriptures as believers. And however, we need to also notice that there is a disconnect, especially, you know, in Christian circles of today, that there is a disconnect between what we claim to believe and how we actually live our lives day to day. You know, and I believe that that is a big problem, but I believe that that problem is because we, our beliefs, the stuff that we believe, they live in our minds. But w where we live from, we actually live from a completely different place and we live from our heart. And because there is a disconnect between those two places, from what we believe and, w and from where we live from, that is why we, we uh, find the situations where people believe one thing, but they live something that is completely different. And, and we also need to know something that is true, and I believe that many of us know this, that truth alone is not enough to change a person's life, that facts and figures, they are not enough to change a person's life. Why is that? And I believe it is because truth and facts and figures, they only communicate to the mind. And that would have been fine if we were living out of the mind. But the problem is we are not living out of the mind. We are living out from 
our hearts. And so, and so because truth and facts only communicate to the hearts, that is why they are not able to change our lives. It's because they do not touch our hearts. There is that disconnect. But I'm going to get into that just now. And if you don't believe me, let me just give you a couple of examples. Think about a person who smokes despite knowing that smoking is actually detrimental to their own health. They know the truth. They know the facts. That is a statement of fact that smoking is not good for your health, but they continue to smoke. Why? Because there's a disconnect. Here's another example. I know that exercising is good for me, and yet I continue to eat a junk food and unhealthy food and still don't exercise. I know the truth. I know the facts. You know, I know what is true, but I continue to practice as if I don't know what is true. There is a disconnect. Last one. I know that mindless accumulation of money is not going to make me happy, and yet I continue to live as if more money is going to make me happy. Why? There is that disconnect between what I know to be true and from where I live my life from. And the ancients understood that there's a big difference between the mind and the will, between the mind and the heart. You know, the mind is where, reason, is where we reason from, is where logic is, you know, is where we weigh things and do calculations and those kind of things. That is, that is the, the domain of the mind, is where we reason from. But the heart is where we live from, because the heart is the one that controls our will what we want to do. And that is an important thing that we also need to understand. And as long as there is no connection between the, true, the two, which is the heart and the mind, as long as there is no connection between those two, we will continue to believe one thing, but live something else entirely. And this and, and that is because most of Christianity today, most of what we do and teach, even in the churches, uh, affects the mind, deals with the mind, communicates with the mind, but we don't communicate to the heart. We do not get to that place where it, where it drops into our heart and it changes how we live. And you may be asking your question, what is the solution then? You, you're surely not going to just give us questions and problems and not give us a solution. And that's what I'm going to focus on now that um, what is, uh, how do we take what is believed in the mind and impress it upon the heart? I believe the answer to that question is the lost art of meditation. And in fact, I was going to title this message, The Lost Art of Meditation, but that would have gotten the cat out of the bag, and there's no fun in that. I just wanted to maintain some mystery. But I believe that the, the art of, of Christian meditation is the missing piece, is the one that helps us to be able to connect what is in our hearts, what is in our minds and, and our hearts, which is where we live from. And it is important for us to understand that uh, what I'm talking about here is not, you know, what, what is, is taught in, in media, you know, when you watch TV or listen to the news when it comes to meditation, that is mostly the Eastern forms of meditation, you know, Buddhism uh, uh, kind of meditation or even yoga kind of meditation. That is something else entirely. That is something completely different to what I'm talking about here today. So get that out of your mind, you know, and, and listen to what I am talking about. What I'm talking about is Christian meditation, something that is an ancient practice that is all over the Bible, and that's what I'm going to also do to just look at places where it, it, it is in the scriptures. And the, the fundamental difference between the Eastern forms of meditation and Christian meditation is that the Eastern forms of meditation seek to empty the mind through meditation. You meditate so that you can empty your mind. That is the Eastern form of meditation. That is something completely different to what Christian meditation is. And Christian meditation, in a nutshell, is about filling the mind with the truths of Scripture, telling that truth over and over in the mind, allowing it to grip the heart and to stir our affections. That is something that is completely different. I'm sure you will agree with me. And this latter form of, of uh, meditation is, is what is called Christian meditation and, and the one that is found throughout the scriptures. In fact, if you go to Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, it says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed 
is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of, scor of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Meditation is the key, is the missing link that takes what is believed in the mind and impresses it upon the heart so that there is harmony between what a person believes and how a person actually lives day to day. That is what meditation does. And you almost cannot speak today of meditation without talking about the Puritans. Well, what are the Puritans? And the Puritans were a, a, a group of Anglican priests between the 16th and the 17th century. And so there were a group of Anglican priests, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to purify, and that's where Puritans come from. Is, it comes from the fact that they wanted to purify the Anglican church of its remaining Catholic influence. Because remember, the Anglican church broke out of or came out from the Catholic church, but it still retained some of the influence. It still retained some of the rituals. And so these ministers, they wanted to break off from that even more. You know, they wanted to to purify the Anglican Church of its remaining influence of Catholicism and the rituals and to return it to the simple faith of the New Testament Church, which is what we see in the Gospels and in the Book of Acts and, and in the New Testament. They wanted to return the, the Church to that simple faith of the New Testament. In fact, one of the Puritans, George Swinock, he, he defines meditation as a strong application of the mind to some sacred subject till the affections be warmed and quickened, and the resolution heightened and strengthened thereby against what is evil and for what is good. And in essence, there's three things that he touches on there. He says there is some sacred subject that we need to apply our mind to, and the, and the result of that is, is so that our affections, which is also our emotions, are warmed and quickened. And the, and the second result is that our resolution is heightened and strengthened. That is what we want to do. That is our will and our resolve. So that it is heightened and strengthened against what is evil and towards that which is good. That is what he defines Christian meditation as. And Don Whitney, he defines meditation simply as deep thinking on the truths and spiritual realities revealed in Scripture for the purposes of understanding, application, and prayer. And we also need to understand that the goal of meditation is not meditation itself. It's not just to sit in the corner in a dark room and just say you are meditating and thinking all day long. That is not the goal of meditation. The goal is so that we may understand and not only that, but also apply, that we may apply what we have studied in the scriptures, that we may live completely different lives. And the third one is prayer. And in Psalm chapter 63, verse 5 to 6, the psalmist writes this. It says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. This is what the psalmist says. You know, he says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate upon you in, uh, in the watches of the night, on my bed as I sleep, as I think, as I, as I run through this truth over and over in my mind, the result of that is that my soul will be satisfied in you as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. And so meditation is about communion with God. It's about spending time with God, knowing and enjoying him in actual unhurried moments, meditating on and praying to him. That is what Christian meditation is about. It's about knowing and enjoying God in actual unhurried moments. There is no rush. You set some time apart. You know, you are intentional about it and you meditate on him and you pray to him. And this is more, this is more important Right now, you know, and, and I think throughout all of time, this is more important than anything else in our lives. Regardless of how uh, urgent the other things may appear in our lives, we simply cannot go without this. We simply cannot not meditate, you know, because we are so busy, we don't have time. We need to make time for um, Christian meditation. And if you remember earlier, one of the definitions, it was um, applying of the mind, uh, seriously applying the mind upon some sacred subject. And so the, one of the questions is, what are these sacred subjects? And so the Puritans had seven subjects that they said, you know, Christians and believers need to meditate upon. And I'll just 
give them to you right now, and, and you can try and apply them in your life. And the first one of the seven subjects, sacred subjects that we need to meditate on as believers is the majesty of God. Just thinking about the majesty of who God is in his creation, you know, in, in, as revealed also in scripture, just to think about who he actually is. And, and they said that a glimpse of God's majesty produces fear and love in our hearts. You know, it produces that sense of, of fear because God is so big, God is so majestic because of, of how he's revealed in creation. Uh, but it also creates in us a sense of love, you know, because it's not just, it's not just um, a, a God who creates terror in us, but it's a God who also attracts us with his love. And so a glimpse of God's majesty produces fear and love. And the second one that we need to meditate on, this is the second uh, subject that we need to meditate on. It is the severity of sin. We cannot forget the severity of our sins. After we have meditated upon the majesty, the beauty, and the goodness of God, we also need to meditate upon the severity of our sins. And a sense of sin's severity excites sorrow and hatred in our lives. And the third one is the beauty of Christ. A taste of Christ's beauty stirs delight and desire. And the fourth one is the certainty of death. We will all die one day. We need to think about that, remind ourselves of that fact. The fourth one is the finality of judgment. We need to always remember that one day, everyone who has ever lived, everyone who will ever live, will stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ and be judged for how they have lived while they were here on earth. And the sixth one, we need to meditate on the misery of hell, just how miserable hell is, just how uh, tormentous hell is. We need to always remind ourselves, you know, of the reality and the misery of hell. And the, second, and the seventh one, the last one, is the glory of heaven. These are the seven subjects that we need to constantly be reminding ourselves of, meditating upon. And as we meditate upon them, they are going to drop. Sorry, they are going to draw us towards God and draw us away from that which is evil. They are going to incite in us feelings and affections of love towards God. And they're going to help us to be able to do what God wants us to do. And so uh, let me read this verse again, the verse that we started with as I conclude. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, ESV says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Or in the New King James, meditate on these things. And as I conclude, a relationship with God is not just about accumulation of, of knowledge about him. This is something that I've already touched on. This, this is not the goal. The goal is not for us to know more about God than the next person. But the goal is to have a, a real and a living relationship with God. And the living and the real relationship with God involves the mind. That is true. Cannot run away from that. It does involve the mind, but it doesn't only involve the mind. It also involves our hearts. It also involves our affections. It also involves our will and the things that we do. And when God saved us, through the sacrifice of his son, he didn't save us just so that we could become philosophers, you know, people that only think about these things. He saved us so that we could be in a love relationship, a true, a genuine love relationship in every sense of the term. And uh, Richard Baxter says this. He says, the ablest scholar, the scholar who is most able, is one who can get a passage of scripture from his ear to his brain. The best. So that is what a, the, the ablest scholar. But the best Christian is one who can get that passage of scripture from his brain to his heart. Great truths are only great truths to us as they affect our hearts. Meditation pounds truth into our hearts. And so my hope, as I conclude, my hope is that, is that the church would go back, the church would return to this important 
uh, and powerful spiritual discipline. And so if you are a believer, let me challenge you to set some time apart just this coming week. And you don't have to meditate for long periods of time. You can just set 10 minutes or 15 minutes, uh, maybe once or even, even a number of times during the week, 15 minutes, and just try to apply your mind to the truths of Scripture until they drop into your heart and change how you live and, and stir up your affections for God so that you can love him more than you do right now. And if you are not a believer here this morning and you are hearing all of this, and some of it, you know, some of it may not make sense to you, but this is the one that I want you to understand, that it is impossible for you to really live the life that God wants you to live unless you are born again. You know, we cannot uh, try with our own efforts to live the life that God wants us to live, and that is why God sacrificed the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave him to live the life that you were supposed to live on your behalf. But not only that, when Jesus Christ was hanging upon the tree, upon the cross, he was hanging for your sins and not for his sins because he lived a sinless and a perfect life. And so what he wants from you, he wants you to believe in him. There's nothing that you need to do. You do not need to try harder to live the life that pleases God, but you need to accept what God has already done on your behalf by sacrificing his only son. And as, as Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 10 says, that we need to confess with our mouths that the Lord Jesus Christ is, is the Lord and that he is God. And that we need to believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And that when God did that, he was doing it for us so that our sins may be forgiven. When you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you believe with your heart that indeed God raised him from the dead, you will receive salvation. You will receive this new birth that I spoke of. And when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he gives new birth to you. You become a different and a new person. And that is when you will be able to live the life that pleases God. And so if you are here and you've never done that before, what you can do is to simply pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins and to accept what God has done on your behalf through the sacrifice of his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will not defer this decision, that you will not say you will be able to do it later because we do not know the day that we will die. We do not know how long we have here on earth. I hope that you will be able to make this decision and make it right now. And so let us just conclude by praying together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful, for this powerful, for this very important spiritual discipline. Father, I pray that you may help us Lord God, to reclaim it and to return to it, Father God. And I pray for each and every person who's going to apply it in their lives this coming week. I pray that you may help us to be able to see the fruit from it. Pray that you may help us to be able to see those affections being stirred, those affections being warmed, Father God, and our will um, and our resolution being strengthened and heightened towards that which is good and away from that which is evil. Father, I pray for every person who's made that decision to receive the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. Lord, I pray for them, Lord, that you may help them to grow, that you may open their eyes, Father God, to be able to understand your word as they apply themselves into your word. I pray, Father, that you may protect them and that you may shield them, Lord, from the evil one up until the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray all this in Jesus' mighty name, now and forevermore. Amen. We have come to the end of today's service. What a wonderful message it has been. We hope that it has ministered to your heart. If you are new, don't forget to sign up for our guest lounge taking place next week Sunday at 10 a.m. The details will follow on the screen. Have a blessed week and enjoy.